Hi students, I am Dr. Sharad Balaji, pediatrician on behalf of PW. We are going to discuss about some topics on neurology. Not all, some topics on, we are going to just give it some important topics, question based topics on neurology. Okay? Are you ready my dear friends? Let's go. So the topic for today's discussion is some aspects of pediatric neurology. First question. So what is this? The skin lesions evident even at birth in a patient with a neurofibroma is scaphole spot, axillary freckling, inguinal freckling, neurofibroma, plexiform neurofibroma. You all know that these lesions occur in patients with the neurofibroma, NF1 particularly. But the question here is, what are all the lesions which are evident at birth? What are all the lesions which are evident at birth? That is the question. So what is the answer? Can anyone tell me what is the answer? Okay. Before that, two main questions that we need to know with respect to Neurofibroma type 2. Can anyone tell me what are all the lesions involving neurofibroma type 2? In neurofibroma type 2, it is predominantly posterior subcapsular cataract. Posterior subcapsular cataract. Cataract. One. Second one is, one is posterior subcapsular cataract. One. Second one is what else? Schwannoma. Second one is schwannoma or vestibular neuroma. Vestibular neuroma. These are all the two lesions which occurs in patients with neurofibroma too. So when the question is the following are lesions of neurofibroma one except means Kindly search for posterior subcapsular cataract and kindly search for schwannoma because they are the lesions of neurofibroma 2 and not neurofibroma 1. You all know that scaphole spots will come, axillary freckling will come, inguinal freckling will come, neurofibroma, plexiform neurofibroma, all can come. But beyond that, what are all the things that can come in children with the neurofibroma 1? One? one is, what is left here? The points which are left are, one is sphenoidal dysplasia. Sphenoidal dysplasia occurs in neurofibroma 1. Sphenoidal dysplasia occurs in neurofibroma 1. And the second one is, non-union of tibia, non-union of tibia, otherwise known as pseudoarthrosis, otherwise known as pseudoarthrosis. These are all the two bone manifestations which are often asked in our entrance MCQs. One is spinoidal dysplasia, second one, second one is non-union of tibia, otherwise known as pseudoarthrosis, apart from these lesions which are mentioned in this choices. What else? One more point in neurofibroma 1 is UBO. Can anyone tell me what is called UBO? Can anyone tell me what is called UBO? UBO means unidentified bright object. UBO means unidentified bright objects. That is called UBO. Unidentified bright objects. That is called UBO which doesn't carry any significance, query significance. These unidentified bright objects do not carry any significance. So what are all the lesions which are mentioned here? As we have discussed already, neurofibroma 1 means bilateral vestibular schwannoma. Second one is posterior subcapsular cataract. This is for NF2, whereas for NF1, Unidentified bright objects or UBO in an MRI is doesn't carry any significance and it resolves over a period of time. 
now what are all the things that we had discussed right now the things that we have discussed we had discussed right now are for the choices so iris or lish nodules iris or lish nodules when it will be considered as significant they will be considered as significant they are nothing but hematomas they will be considered significant only when they are more than 2 in number 1 more than 2 in number 1 second point you can have small small neural nodules otherwise known as neurofibroma second one is plexiform neurofibroma is characterized by uh, large lesions involving the nerve trunk is called plexiform neurofibroma there will be abundant growth of those neural tissues in order to reduce the size of those tissues you can use this drug called selumitinab you can use the drug called selumitinab for to reduce the size of neurofibroma and this is an mcq and you all know that the chromosomes involved with the neurofibroma 1 is 17 and neurofibroma 2 is 22 and it is autosomal dominant in nature. And the third point is you can have plenty of black pigmentation, brownish black pigmentations in the axilla otherwise known as axillary freckles. Axillary freckles. What is there in this picture? Absence of sphenoidal bone otherwise known as sphenoid dysplasia sphenoid dysplasia and what is this you all know that neurofibroma is characterized by the presence of brown macules otherwise known as scaphole spots this scaphole spot okay it should be more than six in number you when, when you need to consider it as patho pathologic if it is more than six in number and remember it should be more than 5 mm in case of pre-pubertal pre less than uh, in pre-pubertal pre -pubertal age it should be more than 5 mm and in pubertal age post-pubertal age it is more than 15 mm to say it is significant and what is this they are prone for optic gliomas neurofibroma patients are prone for optic gliomas. So, a known case of neurofibroma patients comes with blindness or comes with proptosis. You need to think in terms of optic nerve glioma. That's why periodic MRI is mandatory in known patients with neurofibroma. And what is this? These are nothing but unidentified bright objects which doesn't carry any significance which doesn't carry any significance. So, what are all the points we had discussed right now? Lish nodules, neurofibroma, plexiform neurofibroma, scaphole spots, axillary freckles, sphenoidal dysplasia, non-union of tibia otherwise known as pseudoarthrosis, scaphole spots of more than 6 in number in pre-pubertal it is more than 5 mm in diameter and post pubertal it should be more than 15 millimeter in diameter a child with neurofibroma are prone for optic nerve glioma and finally when you see white hyperintern signals in the brain in the mri of a patient with neurofibroma it is usually unidentified bright objects which doesn't carry any significance and remember Seluminitinab is the drug monoclonal antibody used to reduce the drug used to reduce the size of plexiform neurofibroma. Neurofibroma. So to explain further, what are scaphole spots? Scaphole spots are the hallmark of neurofibromatosis. Look here, they are present at birth. I repeat, they are present at birth. Increase in size, number, pigmentation, especially during the first few years of life. I repeat, among all the mentioned points, scaphole spots are present since birth, along with what is the one which are present since birth, plexiform neuro, neurofibroma are usually evident at birth. So, among all lesions, 
your plexiform neurofibroma and cephalus parts are present even from birth even at birth and you all know what is plexiform neurofibroma diffuse thickening of the nerve trunks frequently located in orbital or temporal region that's it look here axillary freckling inguinal freckling usually appears between 3 to 5 years of age and look here neurofibroma characteristically increases in size after adolescence or after pregnancy because of hormonal influences because of hormonal influences so what are all the new points that you have heard today spinoidal dysplasia pseudo arthrosis of tibia otherwise known as non union of tibia scapulae spot is the hallmark of neurofibroma scapulae spots and plexiform neurofibroma are present since birth to reduce the size of plexiform neurofibroma you can use a drug what is called as selumitinab and what are all the other things your uh, neurofibroma increases in size after adolescence as well as after pregnancy what else you want to know that's it with respect to neurofibroma type 1 what are all the things in neurofibroma type 2 spinoidal dysplasia i am sorry neurofibroma type 2 what are all the things posterior subcapsular cataract as well as you have bilateral schwannomas vestibular schwannomas unidentified bright objects does not carry any significance eye problem you need to think in terms of optic nerve glioma in nf1 that's it this is with respect to question number one so going again what are all the at birth scapula spot is present at birth and plexiform neurofibroma is present at birth whereas axillary freckling and inguinal freckling increases between three to five years present from three to five years of age neurofibroma characteristically increases after in number and size after puberty so the answer for this one is a and e a and e okay second question so what is the second question a two-year-old child presents to the casualty with a sudden onset of truncal ataxia and nystagmus sudden onset of truncal ataxia and nystagmus after four episodes of vomiting there are no fever or no signs of meningitis there was history of chicken pox before 15 days csf examination done is normal what is the correct statement about the diagnosis remember the most common cause for ataxia in children is acute cerebellar ataxia or post infectious ataxia i repeat the most common cause the most common cause for ataxia in children is post infectious post infectious ataxia majority of them the post infection is due to post varicella post varicella so this child probably must be suffering from post varicella ataxia the question here is what is the correct statement about the diagnosis varicella immunoglobulin is to be given immediately point number one second long term sequelae like behavioral problems and speech disorders are seen in 90 percent of affected children to long term sequelae third can also follow infection with other viruses such as eco virus and coxsocky virus remember post infectious varicella has got excellent prognosis whether you treat or not it usually resolves within two to four weeks after the onset do you need to give acyclovir no use do you need to give an immunoglobulin no use because by the time of presentation the hit has already happened so it is not a fresh one it is a old one but there will not be any use in giving an immunoglobulin even varicella immunoglobulin because it is autoimmune nature 
So this must be wrong. There is no use of giving a varicella immunoglobulin. Majority of them will survive without any mortality or morbidity. Remember, post-infectious ataxia not only can follow varicella, but it can also follow your other viruses like Coxsackie and Ecovirus. So probably answer should be C. Let us see what is given in the choice. Look here, as the disease usually follows the illness by 2 to 3 weeks, varicella immunoglobulin is of no use. It is autoimmune. It is due to the antibody mediated against all those lesions. There will not be any use because it is not fresh. It is not mediated through direct effect of the virus. It is due to the antibody produced against the virus which acts on the cerebellar areas. That's why there is no use of giving a varicella immunoglobulin as of now. Second, as I told you already, it is just an autoimmune response to the viral agent affecting the cerebral lump. Look here, the prognosis for complete recovery is excellent. Only a very small number have got long term sequelae. It can also follow Eco and Kaksaki virus. So, to repeat, post infectious ataxia is the most common cause for acute ataxia in children. Majority of them are due to varicella. It resolves on its own without any morbidity and mortality. Just observe, no need for any treatment. It can also follow Eco and Kaksaki virus. Okay, in the first one we have read about neurofibroma 1 and 2. In the second one, apart from this post-infectious uh, cerebellitis, post-infectious varicella ataxia, what other ataxia we need to learn? Let us see. Let us see. Okay. As we have discussed already, most commonly it follows viral like illness. So, what is this? As we discussed already, it is post varicella or post infectious, post infectious ataxia. No treatment are necessary. One second point what other case scenarios you need to know? A child now brought up with, let me say, a two-year-old child is brought up with ataxia. Mother is saying even in the newborn period, there are neonatal breathing problems. The mother says sometimes the child will be apneic, sometimes the child will be... One second. Okay, sometimes the child will be hyperapneic and sometimes the child will be apneic. So, this kind of apnea, hyperapnea, apnea, hyperapnea are mainly due to lesions involving the cerebellum and the child manifests with neonatal breathing problems and this is called Jubot syndrome. What is this called as? Jubot syndrome due to cerebellar hyperplasia, hypoplasia due to Cerebellar hypoplasia. This is called Jubert syndrome. And in, MI, and in MRI, you will have inverted molar tooth appearance. And in MRI, you will have inverted molar tooth appearance. Second, third one, associated with the middle ear infections are often due to arthritis media involving the cerebellum. Arthritis media involving cerebellum, breaching the bone margin. What is this opsoclonus myoclonus? Very very important. Whenever any child comes with the ataxia, the next thing that you need to see is whether there are nystagmus involving the eye. What is opsoclonus? Opsoclonus means the child will be looking like this here and there, here and there, here and there, here and there, here and there. So this is called opsoclonus and myoclonus often leading to imbalance. When you have this myoclonus leading to ataxia and the opsoclonus, the first investigation that you need to take is urine VMA. What is this? Is the clue I am going to give? Urine vanillyl mandelic acid. Second one is you need to take CT abdomen. Why? 
because the one which presents with the optoclo opsoclonus myoclonus is nothing but your tube that is neuroblastoma that is neuroblastoma this opsoclonus myoclonus is paraneoplastic manifestation of neuroblastoma and this it has got excellent prognosis then what is this A child with ataxia is brought with steatoria. That means what? Fat is not getting absorbed. When fat is not getting absorbed, what are all the causes? One is pancreatic insufficiency. Second is a mucosal defect. These can be taught off. And it is characterized by low cholesterol. Whenever fat is not absorbed, cholesterol will be low. Triglycerides will be low. Vitamin E insufficiency can happen leading on to peripheral neuritis. And if the child is having associated retinitis pigmentosa, what you need to think in terms of, can anyone answer what is this diagnosis? And the diagnosis can be seen clearly in peripheral smear. What is that? The diagnosis is easily visible in the peripheral smear. What is this? In the form of acanthocytes, what is this? This is nothing but A beta lipoproteinemia. This is nothing but A beta lipoproteinemia. Proteinemia, right? And uh, what else? When the child is also having ataxia along with the myoclonic drugs, it can be due to Japanese in Japan Japanese encephalitis because. Japanese encephalitis is predominantly involving your brainstem, basal ganglia, not brainstem, basal ganglia and thalamus leading to imbalance, leading to extrapyramidal symptoms in almost 50% of the survivors. And finally, what is this? And finally, a child with a recurrent uh, sinopulmonary infections or bronchiectasis Due to reduced IgA and on inspection, the child is having telangiectasia. And as you correctly told, the diagnosis is ataxia telangiectasia. And it is characterized by one A is high, another A is low. What A is high? Alpha fetoprotein is high. One A is low. What is that? IgA is low. Apart from that, the child will have ataxia to start with between 2 to 5 years. And telangiectasia will be the evident by about 5 years. 5 years. Okay. 5 years. This is ataxia telangiectasia. And for what is ataxia telangiectasia? It is a DNA repair disorder. And the next case scenario is, it involves 3 tracks. Spinocerebellar tract leading to imbalance, ataxia, yeah, all signs of cerebellum. Corticospinal tract involvement leading to extensor plantar response and increased DTR. Cortico and also absent ankle is due to sensory involvement that is dorsal column. Dorsal column. So what is that? When you have involvement of three tracks of the spinal cord, one tract is corticospinal tract, next, cart is, next tract is spinocerebellar tract and the third one is dorsal column. When all these things are involved, you need to think in terms of Friedrich ataxia, a trinucleotide repeat disorder which is also characterized by Hypertrophic cardiomyopathy in your echo along with pis cavus, along with pis cavus involving your souls. So these are all the things that can be asked. These are all the things that can be asked in your entrance examination. So what are all the things you will be asked? Look here, a rapid revision. What is that rapid revision? One. Whenever any child comes with ataxia, always you need to ask history of varicella. Whenever any child with ataxia along with the neonatal breathing problems, Joubert syndrome. Middle ear infection can breach the middle ear bone and involving your cerebellum. 
sudden onset ataxia along with opsoclonus sees neuroblastoma tetoria ataxia along with low cholesterol is a beta lipoproteinemia and uh, when you have bronchiectasis ataxia along with t laryngectasia it is ataxia t laryngectasia in which one a is high that is alpha fetoprotein another a is low which is your iga that's why you will get recurrent infections and finally three tract involvement corticospinal dorsal tract as well dorsal column as well as spinocerebellar tract involvement along with the Escavus hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is Friedrich ataxia. Definitely, these are all the simple one-liners that can be easily asked with respect to scenarios involving your ataxia. Okay, so question 2 is discussed and then question 3. So, what is this question 3? Okay, what is this question 3? A 2 year old child presents with fever and circulatory collapse. Fever and circulatory collapse. Third question. Fever and the circulatory collapse to the emergency department. Brought to the emergency department. On examination, the child was drowsy with petechial lesions. There was history of fever and vomiting for the past 2 days along with irritability. What do you expect in this case? It was well taught to you in our discussions. Myself and your medicine faculty, Santosh, had discussed cases and scenarios of meningitis in our previous session. If you have any doubt, you can watch it. You will be provided that link or search uh, neuro infections with respect to Santosh and myself. So, those case scenarios were discussed there. So, what is this case? The child is brought with circulatory collapse. That means the child was brought with shock along with petty K. Shock along with petty K along with next signs, irritability, next stiffness. You all know that we are dealing with a case of what? Exactly. When you have a combination or triad of shock, the triad of shock let me say let me let me call it as a triad to remember so when you have a triad of shock ptk due to thrombocytopenia and signs of meningitis invariably you are dealing with a case of exactly meningococcal meningitis meningococcal meningitis It is meningococcal meningitis. What is the drug of choice? Ceftrioxone for 7 days is the drug of choice. What is the thing that you can get in your gram stain? Your gram stain will reveal gram negative diplococci. Gram negative diplococci. Remember, meningococcal meningitis will not occur in an immunocompetent person. Whenever you have meningococcal meningitis, the first and foremost thing that should be ruled out is late complement pathway deficiency. Late complement pathway deficiency. Late complement pathway deficiency. What are late complement pathway deficiency? You all know. C5B29, otherwise known as membrane attack complex. Otherwise known as membrane attack complex. So, what is this? This is a case of meningococcal meningitis. It is gram negative cocaine pass. Gram negative cocaine pass. This is the case scenario. What about when you have gram positive cocaine? It is pneumococcal meningitis. Most common cause for meningitis beyond 3 months is pneumococcal meningitis. And acid phosphate bacilli means it is tuberculous meningitis. Tuberculous meningitis. Okay. So, this case is, what is this case? This case is 
meningococcal meningitis characterized by the triad of meningitis petechiae shock what is this called as this is called waterhouse fredrickson syndrome you all know that is called waterhouse then syndrome it leads to massive capillary leak shock and collapse waterhouse fredrickson syndrome okay third question okay third question next okay gram negative diplococci remember always rule out late complement pathway defect c5b29 one more point i want to mention is what is the assay you need to do you need to do ch50 assay ch50 assay means from there you will get all early and late complement so the single investigation that should be done to rule out the complement pathway defect is ch50 assay previously now you can use next generation sequencing but previously we had been using ch50 assay So third question regarding meningococcal meningitis over. Then a four-year-old child brought with acute onset of fever. Four-year-old child brought with acute onset of fever, irritability and vomiting for the past two days. Okay, probably a case of meningoencephalitis. Presents with the right focal seizure and altered sensorium. CSF analysis reveals revealed RBCs, mononuclear cells. That means lymphocytes. Sugar thirty six. It is low, but not that much low to the extent of extent of bacterial meningitis. Proteins are usually forty here, little bit elevated, hundred milligram per deciliter. A CT brain is normal. EEG revealed lateralized discharges. What is the ideal empirical treatment at this stage? Is this a case of tuberculous meningitis? No, my dear. Tuberculous meningitis is characterized by subacute onset. it is characterized by subacute onset it occurs over a period of days to weeks second one is the characteristic features of tb r tb meningitis are presence of tuberculoma presence of basal exudate presence of hydrocephalus presence of hydrocephalus and then presence of what else hydrocephalus in fact these are all the characteristic features of tuberculous meningitis these are all the characteristic of tuberculous meningitis okay what will happen in tuberculous meningitis your csf sugar will be low normal not very low 36 can be accepted yes 36 can be accepted protein 100 mg per deciliter yes can be accepted csf showing rbc is it a traumatic let us see but ct revealed ct did not reveal anything mri they didn't mention if it is a case of tuberculous meningitis by this time you should have developed hydrocephalus but again here just to two days this acute manifestation please do not diagnose tuberculous meningitis always acute means hyper acute mean within hours within days means think in terms of viral particularly je and herpes followed by acute pyogenic acute means pyogenic sub acute over a period of days to weeks means japanese encephalitis is it a case of uh, tuberculous meningitis definitely not because just two days of illness followed by sensorium least likely to be due to tuberculous meningitis intravenous antibiotics preceded by steroids what does it mean intravenous antibiotics mean it is is it a case of pyogenic meningitis for pyogenic meningitis the protein will be more than 500 
it is neutrophils rather than lymphocytes here there are lymphocytes not neutrophils unlikely be due to bacterial meningitis and finally in uh, bacterial meningitis the csf sugar will be very 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 low to the extent of less than 10 mg per deciliter are low but here the csf sugar is little bit low normal intravenous amphotericin b fungal meningitis are characteristic of diabetes mellitus particularly it occurs during when the patient getting treatment for diabetic ketoacidosis or in an immunodeficiency status. So less likely here there is no such history. As a result of which considering and ruling out all factors it must be a case of herpes simplex encephalitis. Because in herpes simplex encephalitis you will have involvement of temporal lobe which can be manifested as lateralized discharges over the temporal lobe and the characteristic feature of pure herpes simplex encephalitis is one is focal neurological deficit second one is altered behavior third one is rbc's in csf Majority of the time, RBCs in the CSF will be misinterpreted as traumatic LP. It is not so. When you have a scenario suggestive of herpes simplex encephalitis, along with the EEG showing lateralized discharges and temporal lobe encephalitis, think in terms of herpes simplex encephalitis. What is the investigation of choice? The investigation of choice is PCR analysis of CSF. PCR analysis of CSF. Drug of choice is acyclovir, 20 mg per kg per dose, thrice daily for not 14 days. It is usually 21 days. This is all about, we had discussed about herpes simplex encephalitis. We had discussed about tuberculosis meningitis 2 in this scenario. As far as this question is concerned, answer is C. The clues are RBCs. The clues are lateralized discharges, mildly elevated protein, low normal sugar, lymphocytic predominant, focal seizure, and periodic lateralized discharges. MRI will reveal dash in this picture. What MRI will reveal? MRI will reveal temporal lobe encephalitis. Acute onset, focal seizures, hemorrhagic CSF, herpes simplex encephalitis. Most common is herpes simplex type 1. What is called PLETS? Periodic lateralized epileptiform discharges. Lateralized means lateralized towards temporal lobe. Remember, most commonly involves your temporal lobe as we discussed already. We used to start acyclovir at the end of 14 day do CSF analysis. If the CSF is clean and neat, well and good. If it is not, you need to give for another 7 days. So the total duration is 7, 21 days. This is all about herpes simplex encephalitis. Then, what is this fifth question? Let us see. Yeah. Okay, I am sorry, Pa. A 8 month old infant was admitted with fever, vomiting, convulsions before a week. Look here. Whenever the symptoms are running for more than a week, always you need to think in terms of what? Very good. Tuberculosis meningitis. CSF analysis reveals, let, let us see here. CSF, but here a 8 month old army fever only convulsion before a week. One week back, the child is getting admitted. CSF analysis revealed 2000 polymorphonuclear neutrophils. So, what does it mean, my dear boys and girls? It is predominantly neutrophil. So, what does it mean? Predominantly neutrophils means 
you need to think in terms of bacterial meningitis whereas very much a high lymphocytic predominant in case of tuberculous meningitis minimal elevation of lymphocytic predominance in herpetic encephalitis and japanese encephalitis so i repeat you win csf if it is neutrophils if it is neutrophils you are dealing with a case of pyogenic meningitis if the csf shows lymphocytosis very high means tbm marginally high means think of herpes simplex japanese encephalitis here the neutrophils are sky high so it has to be a case of pyogenic meningitis sugar is low but not that low protein is high 300 mg per deciliter the child was diagnosed to as a case of acute bacterial meningitis and was treated with the corticosteroids and antibiotics you all know that bacterial meningitis the drug of choice is zone but in places where pneumococcus is resistant to penicillin you can add a combination of zone and vancomycin so the child can be started either on zone and vancomycin why steroids particularly dexamethasone each and every suspected case of acute bacterial meningitis will be given a dose of dexamethasone for about a day or two a maximum of 5 to 7 days along with the first dose of antibiotic why because it greatly reduces the incidence of sensory neural deafness occurring as a result of sequelae of treating a bacterial meningitis okay csf gram stain showed gram positive cocci gram positive cocci means probably it is streptococcus pneumococci streptococcus pneumonia or else i can say pneumococci but even with antibiotics the child did not show any improvement with persistent fever emesis and increasing its circumference what is the next step in management what is the next step in management so what is the diagnosis what is the diagnosis see it is definitely a case of bacterial meningitis the child was started on ceftriaxone but despite that the child is not showing any kind of improvement the choice is leave it left to you what is this empirical att why child despite antibiotic is not responding to it can i give empirical att my dear boys and girls the answer is no why because there is no lymphocytic predominant even though it is little bit of chronicity but there is gram positive cocci it is not afb bacilli it is gram positive cocci so it is not the answer brain imaging and aspiration let us see what is it empirical acyclovir how can it be there are no rbc's mentioned there are no rbc again it is polym pmn neutrophilic predominant less likely to occur in a case of viral meningitis so less likely repeat lp repeat lp but here why there is increase in its circumference remember my dear friends the most two most common complications while treating a case of bacterial meningitis are one is subdural abscess the second one is brain abscess in both these instances you need to remove the area where pus is present so what should be the suspicion in this proven bacterial meningitis one is subdural abscess second one is la brain abscess in those instances you need to take in those instances you need to take an mri to rule out an ongoing subdural abscess and the treatment of choice is continue the antibiotic pass anywhere remove it so drain it so drain it okay so take an mri remove the abscess the child will be fine continue the antibiotic so here it is bacterial meningitis the complication is subdural if you empyema treatment is aspiration so answer is b answer is b so subdural effusion pus what you need to do 
if there are open fontanel you can remove or aspirate through it if because this is a 8 month old child afl usually closes by 18 month that's it okay pick out the wrong statement about duchenne muscular dystrophy from the following can anyone tell me what is this duchenne muscular dystrophy one second Done. You all know what is Duchenne muscular dystrophy. Duchenne muscular dystrophy, the points that you know are it is an X linked disorder, almost affect voice. What is the manifestation? Proximal muscle weakness. I repeat proximal muscle weakness. What is the characteristic finding? You will have Gower sign. You will have Gower sign. And what is the characteristic investigation? Increased CPK, creatinine phosphokinase. It will usually is less than 150 milligram, but in these cases it will be more than 1000. I have seen even 15,000 uh, CPK values, international units per liter. Over sign. And what else? Yeah, what is the investigation of choice? MLPA. Investigation of choice is multiplex ligation probe assay, MLPA. Okay, MLPA which shows exon deletion, which shows exon deletion. <coughs> which shows exon deletion. What else exon deletion? So, the, what is the treatment you can give prednisolone? It can just postpone the ambulation. And right now we are dealing with uh, so many gene therapies. Here you can try atalurin, a form of gene therapy, or ertiplersin, again a gene splicing therapy, splicing therapy, ertiplersin. So this is the bird's eye view that I want you to know regarding Duchenne muscular dystrophy. Is there any role of muscle biopsy? No. Only when your mutation is negative, you can do muscle biopsy and go for dystrophin staining. Otherwise, there is no need to do a muscle biopsy. So, the question here is, what is the wrong statement? What is the wrong statement about DMD? What is the wrong statement? Extraocular muscles are preser relatively preserved. When you see any case of Duchenne muscular dystrophy, there will not be any ptosis. There will not be any diplopia. Majority of the time, they are well preserved. So, correct. Ankle reflex is well preserved till late, whereas knee jerk is lost before. So, what does it mean? See, whenever in case of myopathies, the proximal Reflex will be last and distal reflex will be persistent in case of myopathy. Whereas in case of neuropathy, distal will be last first. So I repeat, in case of myopathy, proximal reflex will be last. So knee jerk will be last. In case of peripheral neuropathy, you will the first one is to lose is ankle reflex. But here the question is. Myopathy. Myopathy means knee jerk is last before ankle. So, correct. Incontinence due to anal and urethral sphincter weakness are uncommon. Fusion muscular dystrophy usually involves skeletal muscles and not these striated sphincter muscles. So, answer is correct. Yes, it is uncommon. So, three choices are correct. So, we are left to one choice. During terminal stages of the disease, the CPK levels increase in huge amounts than earlier. Can anyone tell me is it correct or wrong? Invariably, you might think that since the first three choices are ruled out, the fourth must be the answer. But my question is explain how. Remember, for any case of proximal muscle weakness, we as pediatrician do serum CPK as a screening test to rule out your 
Duchenne muscular dystrophy. But remember, your CPK values will not correlate with the severity because at the terminal stages of illness, when almost all muscles are lost or degenerated and all muscles are replaced by fat, what will happen? There will not be any CPK inside the muscle to get released as a result of which CPK will be normal or low in terminal stages of Duchenne muscular dystrophy. In the beginning when you diagnose a case at 4 years or 5 years, your CPK will be sky high. But when they are going to die about by 20 or 22 years, your CPK will be invariably low or normal because there is no live muscle to release all those enzymes. That's it. So the answer is D. Look here, the terminal stages of the disease, the serum CPK is considerably lower, lower as a because there is less muscle to degenerate. Answer is D. Okay, done. Um, this was also discussed, my dear boys and girls. In case of bacterial meningitis, it is predominantly neutrophils. Whereas in case of viral meningitis, it is predominantly lymphocyte. Protein will be high in case of bacterial, low in case of viral, variable in case of TB. In case of spinal arachnoiditis, the CSF values can be high. Spinal TB arachnoiditis. Glucose will be very low, here low, here low, not very low. The only viral infection that produces severe low sugar in CSF is mumps. I repeat, the only viral infections that reduces your CSF sugar to very low count is your mumps and rarely your herpes simplex encephalitis. Here you need to know gram staining. But in case of viral CSF PCR analysis, in case of bacterial, we don't rely on AFB smear right now. We rely on CB0, CSF CB0, PCR based analysis, or, CV, or CSF MGIT, mycobacterial growth inhibitor tube system, which is nothing but a liquid culture. Okay. Right, a small revision we had discussed. Which neural tube abnormalities features incomplete fusion of occipital area along with the retroflexion of neck and trunk as depicted in that picture? As depicted in that picture. Let us see one by one. When you have tuft up, these are all neural tube defect because of the fault in the closure of the Neural tube cranially and neural tube caudally and your vertebral column in between. When you have tuft of hair over the spine but a normal vertebral but without any protrusion of meninges or spine, spinal nerves that is called spina bifida occulta. It is spina bifida occulta. Occulta. When meninges only protruding through the defect, then it is called meningoceal. Then it is called as what? Meningoceal. Seal. When there is protrusion of meninges as well as spinal nerves through the defect, it is called as myelomeningoceal. It is called as myelomeningoceal. Meningoceal. Protrusion of brain tissue anteriorly, it is called as frontal encephalocele. It is called as frontal encephalocele. Whereas protrusion of brain tissue posteriorly is called as occipital encephalocele. It is called as occipital encephalocele. And finally, what is this? Anencephaly with the rachis crisis. Anencephaly means fail absence of brain. Rachis crisis means complete failure of fusion of the 
spinal cord what is this called as this is called as cranio rachis caesis caesis what is this incomplete fusion of occipital area alone along with the severe retroflexion of neck and trunk is called as inian cephaly is called as inian cephaly so these are all the neural tube defects frontal encephalocele cranio rachis caesis occipital encephalocele inian cephaly spina bifida occulta spina bifida occulta meningocele and meningomyelocele these are all the neural tube defects remember almost 70% of neural tube defects can be reduced by giving by giving very good folic acid so what is the dosage of folic acid the dosage of folic acid is if there are no previous history if there are no previous history if there are no previous history folic acid 0.4 mg per day 2 months before and 1 month after conception whereas in case of previous history it is 10 times the dosage that we use 4 mg now it is 3 months before and 2 months after conception when you have a history so what is the question here the question here look at this there is complete severe retroflexion of head and neck a complete severe retroflexion of head and neck this severe retroflexion is suggestive of inian cephaly and in cephaly means absence of brain encephalo means protrusion of brain whereas cranio rachis caesis means anencephaly along with complete absence of closure of the spinal cord right next question 8 in the type of gait depicted in the image given below which of the following conditions is responsible which of the following condition is responsible look at this what is the child has the child has scissoring gait the child has scissoring gait this scissoring gait is due to involvement of spasm of adductor muscles particularly adductor magnus which is usually due to periventricular leukomalacia which is due to what periventricular leukomalacia because the homunculus what do you mean by homunculus the area controlling the thigh muscles are exactly falling over the ventricular area in preterm what is the most common thing in mri brain the most common thing is peri ventricular leukomalacia echo malacia leading on to scissoring gait leading on to what i am sorry leading on to spasm of adductor magnus leading on to spasm of adductor magnus leading on to scissoring gait leading on to scissoring gait scissoring gait the tree usually manifest as toe walking usually manifest as toe walking because of the spasm remember in this and what is this called as this is called spastic diplegia it involves both upper and lower limbs but lower limb is predominantly involved compared to your upper limb predominantly involved compared to your upper limb so what is the treatment of choice treatment of choice is you can give botulinum toxin you can give a uh, spina you can uh, do tendon release su surgeries etc but here the intellectual is intellect is intact intellect is intact it often occurs in preterm 
A preterm with toe walking unless otherwise proved should be considered as a case of spastic diplegia. I repeat, you should be should be suspected as a case of spastic diplegia in which there will be scissoring, toe walking, periventricular leukomalacia, intellect is intact. So this is probably a case of spastic diplegia. What is spastic quadriparesis? Spastic, spastic quadriparesis usually occurs in term babies due to severe hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy stage 3. Hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy stage 3 and usually you will have quadriplegia. Usually severely mental retardation will be present. And in the MRI, majority of areas will be characterized by some cystic changes. Characterized by cystic changes. And here what happens? What happens? So much of poor and cephalic dead spaces. Dead spaces. And there are so many cystic spaces in the brain. Dead tissue in the brain. Otherwise known as cystic encephalomalacia. Otherwise known as cystic encephalomalacia encephalomalacia and finally where do you get this extra pyramidal symptoms where do you get this extra pyramidal symptom this extra pyramidal symptom manifesting as chorea and athetosis occurs in survivors of can anyone tell me what is this exactly survivors of of very good. Kernictus. Survivors of Kernictus. Survivors of Kernictus. This is called spast. This is called um, choreothetoid CP. What is this called as? This is called choreothetoid CP. Okay. Done. So look at here, very, very important, spastic diplegia, second most common predisposing factor is prematurity. In MRI, you will have periventricular leukomalacia. Finding is scissoring right and toe walking. Look here, intellect is very much preserved. Spasticity can be treated by giving diazepam, baclofen, tizanidin, dandrolin to reduce the spasticity. Whereas dystonia can be managed by botulinum toxin, levodopa and trihexyphenidyl. You can try tendon release surgery of Achilles and you can try your physiotherapy. This is with respect to spastic diplegia. What is this? Which is the most common cause of condition given below in the image? Is it a case of tuberculous meningitis? Is it a case of type 2 arnal cherry malformation? Is it a posterior fossa of brain tumor? Is it a congenital aqueductal stenosis? Remember, as we discussed already, what are all the four features of TBM? I repeat, one is hydrocephalus. One is hydrocephalus. Two, tuberculoma. 3. Basal exudate, basal exudate, 4. Anyone? Infarct. Infarct. This is tuberculous meningitis. 1. What happens in type 2 arnal cherry malformation? Type 2 arnal cherry malformation is characterized by arnold cherry type 2. Type 2. It is characterized by what? It is characterized by spinal meningomyelocele. Characterized by spinal meningomyelocele. Myelocele. One. Second, there is complete descent of, there is complete descent of cerebellar vermis. Vermis. Beyond foramen magnum. Beyond Foramen magnum. Spinal meningo encephalo meningo myelocele descent of cerebellum cerebellar vermis beyond foramen magnum as a result of its flat occiput. 
as a result of which flat occiput and a hydrocephal because your descent of cerebellar vermis will block the pathway of CSF from the brain into the spinal cord leading to hydrocephalus. I repeat flat occiput with hydrocephalus along with spinal meningomyelocele is Arnold-Cherry type 2. Whereas in Arnold-Cherry type 1, there is cerebellar tonsillar ectopia. Just cerebellar tonsillar ectopia, there will not be any hydrocephalus. Any hydrocephalus, that is type 2. Type 1, this is type 2. So, tuberculous meningitis, it was discussed. Type 2 Arnold Cherry malformation, it was discussed. What is posterior fossa brain tumors? Let me discuss a few points on posterior fossa brain tumors. Most common tumors of the brain occur in cerebellum. Occur in cerebellum. Either it can occur in midline vermis, occur in midline vermis. Or it can occur in lateral hemisphere. Or it can occur in lateral hemisphere. Lateral hemisphere. Midline vermis means it is usually medulloblastoma. Medulloblastoma, the most common tumor in Indian children. Indian children, whereas lateral hemisphere, lateral hemisphere, the most common tumor is astrocytoma, the most common brain tumor in world, brain tumor in world, in children, okay, in children, apart from that, you can have choroid plexus carcinoma, Choroid plexus carcinoma occurs in Lee from any syndrome. Lee from any syndrome. And then cerebellar hemangioblastoma. Cerebellar hemangioblastoma occurs in Van Hippel Lindau syndrome. Van Hippel Lindau syndrome. Cerebellar hemangioblastoma, Van Hippel Lindau syndrome. Syndrome and uh, finally, what else? Craniopharyngioma, craniopharyngioma, or otherwise known as adamantinoma. The pediatric version is called as adamantinoma. Adamantinoma. So, this is all about brain tumors. A small discussion on brain tumors. Okay. So, is it a case of uh, tuberculosis meningitis, Arnold Cherry, posterior fossa? We don't know, just they have given here. Yeah, uh, maybe a late newborn or an early infant with a massive hydrocephalus. Remember, whenever you see an asymptomatic child with a sun setting sign, sun setting sign, along with hydrocephalus, always think in terms of congenital aqueductal stenosis. Always think in terms of congenital aqueductal stenosis. Stenosis. So, what are all the points that you need to know with regard to congenital hydrocephalus? It is X-linked. So, what does it mean? Occurs in mainly males. Can also be due to Dandy Walker syndrome. Arnold Cherry, it was discussed. What about Dandy Walker syndrome? Dandy Walker syndrome is characterized by posterior fossa cyst is characterized by posterior fossa cyst and transillumination positive as well as it has it produces hydrocephalus and finally you will have prominent occiput and finally you will have prominent oxy you have prominent occiput flat occiput with hydrocephalus is arnold cherry type 2 Whereas prominent occiput with hydrocephalus is Arnold Cherry uh, is Dandy Walker syndrome. And uh, Arnold Cherry torch, what is the CAV? Whenever you get 
a combination of CCF with hydrocephalus. Hydrocephalus. It is usually due to CCF with hydrocephalus. It is usually due to vein of gallon malformation. Vein of gallon malformation. Gallon malformation. So what else? Large head difficult labor can be a manifestation of congenital hydrocephalus. When to suspect? Very, 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 very important, my dear friends. When to suspect? Look at here. Postnatal increase in size. Postnatal increase in its circumference by more than 1 centimeter every fortnight. By more than 1 centimeter every fortnight. And also separation of sutures by more than 0.5 cm after 2 weeks. So after 2 weeks separation of sutures by more than 0.5 cm, more than 1 cm of its circumference growth per fortnight. Large anterior fontanel, it can happen in many other conditions. Look here, persistent widen scomoparietal. This is scomus and this is parietal. Persistent separation of scomoparietal. Suture. Ah, whenever you see these findings, you need to suspect aqueductal stenosis. Advanced cases, you have sunset sign and prominent scalp veins. Investigations, MRI. See, ultrasound can be taken if there is open AF. MRI brain can be taken where the pathology with... Uh, so, what happens in congenital... Aqueductal stenosis, lateral ventricles are dilated. Lateral ventricles are dilated. Whereas all ventricles are dilated in tuberculous meningitis. Treatment prognosis is guarded. Bad prognosis because of the destruction of the brain parenchyma because of pressure atrophy. Treatment ventriculoperitoneal shunt as well as endoscopic third ventriculostomy. These are all the treatment that can be offered in a case of congenital hydrocephalus. Now, what is this? A lumbar puncture can be diagnostic and therapeutic utility in which condition? Febrile convulsion. In case of febrile convulsion, we do not do any lumbar puncture unless otherwise we suspect an underlying meningitis. One. Autoimmune diseases, autoimmune disease to find out the NMDA receptor antibody, receptor antibody. Again, this is therapeutic but not diagnostic. Neonatal sepsis, sepsis again diagnostic but not therapeutic, but not therapeutic. So, what must be the answer? The answer must be pseudotumor cerebri, otherwise known as benign intracranial hypertension so what are all the causes for benign intracranial hypertension let's see look here they are most common in obese adolescent females obese adolescent females and why it occurs either due to increased csf production or decreased CSF absorption or increased venous pressure in turn leading to more CSF production. Is this an MCQ? I don't think so. But an obese adolescent female whenever comes with headache, all obese adolescent females comes with headache, you need to suspect in terms of benign intracranial hypertension or pseudotumor cerebri. Look here, the manifestations with Diplopia, headache, sixth nerve palsy, squint, lateral squint. Sixth nerve palsy means convergent squint. Papil edema, visual field effect. Whenever any child with these symptoms, you need to suspect in terms of, in terms of what? Benign intracranial hypertension. Predisposing factors are, one is anemia. Vitamin A, outdated tetracycline, we don't use now. Steroids, yes. OCPS, endocrinopathy. These questions can often be asked. These questions can often be asked. Investigation, look here, there is normal CSF biochemistry. That means WBC will be low. 
sugars will be normal as well as your proteins will be less than 40 mg per deciliter. Neither pressure effect will be produced or, or because of the increased size, you can have a small ventricular size. Treatment is acetazolamide, you all know from your third year. Acetazolamide reduces and glycerol and steroid reduces the CSF pressure. And look here, even doing a simple lumbar puncture often reveals that headache, diplopia. So many signs occur as a result of raised intracranial tension. And finally, it can lead to optic nerve atrophy which can be reduced by optic nerve sheath decompression as well as shunt surgery. But these things are very very rarely used nowadays right now. Majority of the case are resolved by doing a simple lumbar puncture by looking at the normal CSF uh, analysis but increased pressure and also you are reducing the amount of CSF that is present in your uh, in your uh, central in your ventricles as well as the spinal cord by reducing it your pressure is reduced as a result of which all symptoms of pseudo tumor cerebri will be relieved will be definitely this will be a, an important question so with respect to case scenario you need to think in terms of an adolescent female an anemic obese female comes with headache diplopia convergence skin you need to do a lumbar puncture to rule out something and relieve the pressure thought okay so with this we are finishing a short session of neurology so in this we had discussed about some aspects of some important aspects in our uh, session today one is benign intracranial tension okay think in terms of an adolescent female comes with a headache second one is you we have read about aqueductal stenosis what are all the manifestations that we need to know and how much centimeter increase we need to suspect in terms of congenital hydrocephalus congenital hydrocephalus okay congenital hydrocephalus when will you suspect tuberculous meningitis what are all we have discussed about brain tumors we have discussed about brain tumors and we have discussed about various forms of cerebral palsy term babies cystic encephalomalacia quadriplegic cp uh, preterm babies periventricular leukomalacia scissoring gait choreoathetoid cp in which the problem is with the balance it is due to chronic trust survivors okay and uh, various forms of neural tube defects cranioracheschisis um inian cephaly etc various types of tuberculous meningitis and csf analysis dmd we had discussed in detail cases of uh, what is that pyogenic meningitis with a uh, abscess subdural effusion Lateralized epileptiform discharges, temporal lobe, encephalitis, herpes simplex, shock, meningitis, purpure, CSF analysis, gram negative, diplococci, CH50 as a late membrane attack complex. Efficiency can lead to this. Various forms of ataxia and the conditions causing ataxia. And finally, about certain things in neurofibroma. With this, we are finishing our topic for today. Thanks for your patient listening. We will be posting this format in our um, description. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Good night. Bye.